Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. So Galatians 3, uh, we'll be focusing on verses 10 through 14, but we'll actually start reading at Galatians 3 and verse 1. So Galatians 3 and starting at verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Uh, Will you pray with me now? Well, Lord God Almighty, we openly confess, Lord, that we are hungry and you are the only one who can satisfy us. Uh, We are broken and you are the only one who can heal us. Uh, We struggle and you are the only one who can strengthen us. We wander, and you're the only shepherd who can draw us back in. And so we ask, Lord, that now as we approach your word, as we consider again your holy gospel, our Lord, we pray that streams of grace and mercy might flow out and change us, Lord, that you would minister the wonderful, beautiful grace of the gospel uh, to our hearts and our consciences. Please come and open our eyes through your spirit that we might see the riches and the beauty of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one thing that uh, guys particularly seem to enjoy uh, is demolishing things. I learned from my children that this begins about the age of one. But guys love demolishing things. It might be a block of tower, a tower of blocks. It might be a Lego city. It might be a tree. It might be an entire building. But there's something just so satisfying about seeing that whole thing uh, come crashing to the ground. And when it comes to demolishing things, uh, the key is you've got to target uh, kind of the pivotal structural bits, for want of a better word. You find the load-bearing walls, you smash them out, 
and the whole thing comes crashing down with a satisfying crash. And really, that's what Paul uh, is doing here in Galatians. Uh, He's targeting the load-bearing wall of something that needs to come crashing down. But it's not a tower of blocks. It's not a building. Instead, it's what he calls in Galatians 1 a different gospel, a lie, a deception, a subversion of the truth, are the subtle but deadly lie that acceptance with God can be found through what we do. And all through the book of Galatians, what he's doing is he's pulling out the load-bearing walls so that that false gospel might come crashing to the ground. And in these verses before us, verses 10 through 14, uh, there's kind of a simple but dense argument that Paul is making. And there's three steps to the argument. And the first step is that law leads to curse. Law leads to curse. Now, before we jump into these verses, we need to understand at least a little bit about what's going on. Now, if we're going to rightly understand uh, the answer and we first need to understand the question. So Paul is writing this letter uh, to a young church or a young group of churches in the area of Galatia. Uh, They were made up of mostly Gentiles or non-Jews. And like I said, they're a very young church. They've come to faith in Christ Jesus, but they are young in the faith. And then it seems that what happened is that a whole group of Jews, uh, probably called the Judaizers, came to this this young church. And they began to teach them. And what they taught them was that if you want to be a true Christian, a real Christian, a mature Christian, you need to be circumcised. You need to come back to the law of Moses. Moses. I don't know what this fellow Paul was teaching you, but you need to be circumcised. You need to be obeying God's law. That's what a real Christian is. And so they came in, they infiltrated the church, and they're undermining both Paul's authority and also Paul's message. And particularly in chapter 3 of Galatians, what Paul's doing is he's trying to tell them are actually all these things I've been telling you, are that you're saved by faith alone, that you're justified by Christ alone. Now, they weren't my idea. Rather, they're exactly what we find in the Old Testament Scriptures. And that's why you might have picked up as we read through those verses that there's quotation after quotation after quotation are from the Old Testament, that he's showing them this is cutting against the grain of the very truth of God. Now, if you look down with me at verse 10, it says this, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And his point is that actually to put yourself back under the law isn't maturity, It isn't salvation. No, actually, it's to put yourself back under the very curse of God. Now, that phrase, works of the law, uh, doesn't first mean kind of good works in general, right? Don't think Mother Teresa. But rather, it's a technical term for obedience to the law of Moses. So why? Why does this lead to being put back under the curse? Well, the quotation, which comes from Deuteronomy 27, uh, gives us the answer. It says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and keep them. And the key word there is that little word, all. The point Paul's making is that these Galatian Christians need to understand the full implication of what they're receiving from these Judaizers. Right, as it were, they need to read the fine print. That by putting themselves back under the law, they're not simply committing to a few Jewish practices, 
Rather, they're putting themselves back under the exacting demands of the old covenant. Now, just a chapter or so further in Galatians 5.3, Paul puts it like this. He says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. You see, the way the law operates is quite simple. It blesses those who keep it perfectly, and it curses those who keep it imperfectly. You see, the logic of the law is that when it comes to your life, an A- minus won't cut it. A 99% isn't good enough. You must be perfect, without blemish, without imperfection. Right? The logic of the law is make one mistake. Game's up. Ever made a mistake? Ever sinned? Ever had mixed motivations? Ever had a selfish or impure thought? Game's up. Game's over, no second chances. You see, in the most reverent sense of the word, to seek life through the law is damning. And what's this curse that's mentioned? Well, put simply, it's actually that God himself, the infinite personal God, would be against you. Now, if you read through Deuteronomy 27 and 28, where Paul's already quoted from, It outlines what the curse would look like for national Israel living in the promised land of Canaan. And behind all the contextual details is a sense that actually God himself would be against them in all that they do. In Deuteronomy 28 verse 63, it says this. It says, as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, So the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. Isn't that a terrifying verse? That's where law leads. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Now, while this was a specific indictment of a specific heresy, it's also really a blanket indictment of any attempt uh, to work our way to God. Any attempt to build our own stairway to heaven. You see, any single way of trying to earn God's favor, earn your way into good relationship with God, even if it's hiding under a religious disguise, as to be under the curse. It's to have the curse like an ominous black cloud about to break over your head. Law only leads one place. And that place is curse. So first step of the argument, law leads only to curse. Which leads to the second step of the argument, which is actually that when it comes to salvation, our law and faith are different operating systems. Law and faith are different operating systems. So if you look down at verse 11, Paul goes on to say, now it's evident that no one is justified or declared righteous before God by the law. Why? For the righteous shall live by faith. Now, that's a quotation from Habakkuk. And the point that it makes is that life comes through faith. Right? Life comes through believing. The righteous shall live by faith. And then in verse 12, if you look down, he goes on from quoting Habakkuk to to quoting Leviticus. And he says, but the law is not of faith, rather, and this is straight from Leviticus, the one who does them shall the one who does them shall live by them. So the logic here, just to kind of help you, because it's quite a dense wee passage, is kind of like this. Life comes through faith. Law is not of faith. Therefore, law cannot give life. Right? It's actually quite simple what he's saying. 
And you might have noticed that both in the quotation from Habakkuk and the one from Leviticus, it both mentions those words, to live. That is, it were, faith and law are describing two totally different ways to live. You might think of it a little bit like a lawnmower. That in our day and age, uh, you can either have an electric lawnmower or a petrol lawnmower. Now, outwardly, these two lawnmowers look quite similar. Right? They've both got kind of that general lawnmower shape. Uh, they've both got that long handle that you hold. They've both got the rotating blade that cuts the grass. Right? Externally, they, they look pretty similar to one another. But inside those two lawnmowers are completely different operating systems. That if you open them up, although they look similar on the outside, on the inside, they're two totally different engines that work on totally different principles. And actually the same is true here of faith and law. That they're not two sides of the same coin, they're not two slightly different ways of saying the same thing. No, they're two completely opposite and conflicting frameworks. Now, the framework of law is do this and you will live. While the framework of faith is Christ has done, so you get life. Can you see how different those two things are? Right, the law says, do it perfectly. But faith says, Christ has done it perfectly. Our law says, do, work, perform. But faith says, receive. You see, one gives life to the doer, while the other gives life to the believer. Because while in principle the law can give life, uh, in practice it's a dead end. It's a one-way street. Because it demands nothing short of perfection. The one who does them shall live by them. Right? The law would fit quite nicely with, uh, with the old Nike thing. Just do it. Don't try, do it. You see, when it comes to salvation, law and faith are mutually exclusive. Now, it could be very easy to kind of apply this to kind of the generic world out there and say, don't do it. You can't find life through what you do. And it's true, isn't it? It's absolutely true. But it's to miss the barb of this passage, which is that this is written to a church. This is written to professing believers. And so actually God, through Paul, is saying to us, are you started in faith alone, in Christ alone? Be sure that you continue trusting only in that faith. Guard the gospel freedom you have received. Beware of the gradual drift into legalism. It's a dead end, a false gospel. Maybe you've noticed this drift in yourself. Now, one common sign of this drift is that you've lost all joy in your Christian life. And instead, now you only experience a constant pressure to do more, be better, be a better Christian. Maybe you've noticed that actually when you sin, when you slip up in your Christian life, that you try and just work really hard to make God love you again. Or maybe you find ways to punish yourself. Right? Good old Protestant penance. But it comes so naturally to our hearts, doesn't it? And so the application of these verses to us and to our hearts is that it's not how you have received Christ. Right? Doing and performance couldn't save you when you became a Christian. What makes you think it can do it now? Are you started in faith alone in Christ alone? You started with the conviction that there is nothing I can contribute 
that it must be Christ and only Christ. And so hold fast to that every day, every hour. It's not what I do. It's not what I can contribute. It's not my own perceived worth. No, it's Christ and Christ alone. Which leads us to the final uh, piece of the argument, which is that while law leads to curse, faith leads to blessing. You see, the final verses, verses 13 and 14, really answer the question, actually, if the law cannot bless us, then how can blessing be found? Now, all through chapter 3, you might have noticed there were these references to Abraham. And so the question is, how do we know we're a child of Abraham? How do we receive the blessing of Abraham? And the answer, of course, is just back to the basics. Through faith alone and Christ alone. Read verse 13 with me. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Now how is the curse dealt with? How are you made right with God? Well, by substitution. By an exchange of places. Now that quotation in verse 13 refers back to Deuteronomy 21. That part of God's law for his people and his promised land was that when anyone was punished with a crime punishable by death, they would be hanged on a tree to show that they bore the very curse of God. And so repeatedly throughout the book of Acts, often when the apostles preached the gospel, they would emphasize that Jesus was hanged on a tree because that was something that no Jew could miss. The crucifixion was a sign that Jesus bore are the very curse of God. So how does God save us? Well, he saves us through substitution. That as it were, are the curse hung over our heads. Right? Like an invisible but inevitable guillotine just waiting to come down upon us. Just imagine yourself kneeling there, head upon the block. No hope. No way out. Guilty and you know it. Condemned already. But then Christ comes in. And he says, I will stand in your place. Move aside that I might put my head on the block. Father, they have broken your curse. They have broken your law. Let your curse fall on me. Right, that's the gospel, isn't it? Standing guilty, condemned, deserving the punishment that was coming, and yet by grace alone, Christ steps in. And he says, no, I will. I will die that they may live. I will be cursed that they may be blessed. I will be rejected by the Father that they might be accepted. And what's the result? Well, if you look at verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. You see, that's gospel logic. We incur the curse. Christ bears the curse, we get the blessing. It's just grace shining out from every line, unearned, unmerited, nothing we could contribute. But the message here is that actually you have all you could possibly need through your union with Christ the curse bearer. You don't need to look anywhere else when you've got Christ because you've got all you need. You see, when you're a Christian, you never graduate from the gospel. The gospels aren't just the ABC, but they're the A to Z of the Christian life. You've received all you need in Christ through faith. It doesn't need any supplements. It doesn't need any additions that you have to contribute 
No, the same gospel that saved you will keep you. The same crucified Christ that was the sole basis of your salvation when you became a Christian is still the sole basis of your salvation and your life with God day by day. You see, it's when our eyes begin to drift away from the sufficiency of Christ, then is when we begin to drift into legalism. It's a call to remember, to take note of all that is ours in Christ Jesus. The curse has been dealt with. You've been saved through faith in Christ. So don't put the chains back on. And really it was these great truths of justification by faith alone uh, that triggered the Reformation back in the 1500s, uh, which would shake Europe to its very core. And one of the kind of leading reformers, Martin Luther, uh, he expressed the way that these truths impacted him uh, personally. And he wrote this. He said, Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I did not love. Yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. I was angry with God. But at last, by the mercy of God, I gave heed to the context of the words that the righteous shall live by faith. I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness with which the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. I wonder if you've experienced that, that overwhelming joy and that overwhelming just sense of deep relief as you realize that Christ has done it all, that all that God requires of you is found in Christ alone and received by faith alone. That's paradise itself. What a relief for sinners like us. Christ and him alone. You have all you need in Christ, received through the open hand of faith. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the wonderful, wonderful good news that there is salvation for sinners like us. We thank you so deeply for Christ. Lord, we know that we are guilty. We know that in and of ourselves we did stand condemned before the curse utterly guilty, without excuse. And yet, Lord, we thank you that you have provided a saviour. We thank you, Christ, for your willingness to take on human nature, to enter this broken world, to live a righteous life, and particularly, Lord, to go willingly to the cross, to bear your Father's wrath against our sins, our darkness, our perversions, are that we might find life. Father, thank you that through Christ we are blessed eternally and have entered into paradise itself. And so, Father, we believe, help our unbelief. Grant us a deepening grasp of the glory of the gospel. And thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.